Um, the recording is in progress. Everyone should be aware of that. Um, and uh, I'm gonna start calling roll. I know that we have some people who will still be joining us, but I will start that. So Alexa Anderson. Oh, I'm trying, I'm getting here. Yep, I'm here. You know, I see you. Court. I, I see Court. Um, uh, yes, present. Yeah. Uh, Heather Bout. I am here, good morning. Yeah. Frank Cannon. Yep. Peter Fischelis. Okay. Uh, Don Garello. Present. I know Lori's on her way. Uh, Matt Johnson. Present. Thank you. Carrie LaFleur. Harry is out this week. Okay. Pat Nelson, I'm here. Chris Popov. Charlie Parker. Here. Matt Root. Matt, I think I see you. <coughs> uh, I see your name. Oh, no, you're gone. Peter, uh, you're here now. Matt Root is here. Matt, you're here? Yes, yeah, sorry, Pat, I'm here. Thank you. I don't know what the Roberts Rules of Order are if I have to actually hear your voices or Steve Sushesky. Here. Hey, great. Great. Yeah, the, uh, Gail, you're not an official member, so. Um, Peter Fischelis is here too, Pat. Yeah, I, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, I wanted to start off the meeting and I, uh, I don't know, the, the phone number uh, 571-1228, can you just identify, oh, Dory, okay, thank you. All right, so I, I wanted, and Lori is here now, so thank you. I wanted to start off the meeting by uh, acknowledging that something happened in our community this past week um, in the Concord community that I'm sure most are aware of. Um, it was all over the news. I think that um, it uh, a very disturbing event and that Lori was threatened by a member of the Concord community. Um, and I just want to say that this committee stands in total support of you, Lori, and are really sorry that this happened. Um, but, you know, I think that when things like that, it's sort of at the pinnacle of civil discourse begins to fall apart. So um, it's very troubling. Lori, our best wishes are with you. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed <laughs> with what <laughs> happened since last night with outpouring of support and uh, incredibly grateful to the Concord police. And we'll leave it at that for this morning. I'm actually thrilled to be distracted and get back to something else. So thank you for <laughs> assisting with that so early in the day. I'm so glad you're happy to be here with us. I am happy to be here. <laughs> and thank you, Pat. I'm glad you said something because I was going to, so you beat me to it. But <laughs> the community supports you, Lori, and thank you for all that you do for both this committee and our community and our schools on behalf of, you know, co-chair and also parents with kids running around behind me that are off to Alcott shortly. And I just want to remind everyone, please mute if you're not muted, because there is some Pat gets interrupted on my end when um, when there's background noise with those who aren't um, speaking and aren't muted. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. I am very grateful for the support. It, it, it helps get the edge off a little bit. And um, again, the Concord police, I cannot say enough. So we're very fortunate here. We are. We are. Um, we live in a bubble and we don't live in a bubble. So, yeah. I guess that might be the takeaway, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, and I just want to set the context. Our major goal today is to, to listen to our professionals, get updated on the project. We're, you know, we're, we're moving right along. 
Um, we have um, the task of reviewing the items that we are proposing we would consider as deduct alternates. Um, and uh, that's, that's really our major, major focus today. Um, so Ian, I'm gonna, oh, uh, correspondence. Oh, I'm sorry, minutes. <laughs> we have the minutes to approve. I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Hey, Pat, can I just interrupt you? There are two people who aren't muted, Dory and someone that's called F-A-C-S-W. If you guys could just please mute, I would appreciate it. Yeah, F-A-C-S-W is you, Frank. So if you can, thank you. And thank you, Dory. Thank you, guys. So we have the minutes of October 27th and the minutes of November 17th. Um, has everyone had a chance to review those or do you feel ready to vote on them? Approval. Is anybody not ready to vote approval for those minutes? Okay, are there any uh, changes or uh, any comments on those minutes? All right, so then um, if I hear a motion to approve those minutes. Sure, move to approve the minutes of October 27th and November 17th as written. Second. Okay. Um, all right. And again, do I do, need, do I need to do a roll call vote on this? Yes, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> okay. Alexa. Yep. Court. Aye. Heather. Aye. Frank. I made a mute. So yeah. Frank is muted. Um, so we'll just uh, hold on that. Uh, Peter Fischelis? Yes. Thank you. Don Galea? Yep. Lori Hunter? Yes. Pat Johnson? Aye. Carrie LaFleur is not with us today. Pat Nelson? Aye. Chris Papa? Yes. Okay. Um, Charlie Parker? Yes. Matt Root? Yes. And Steve Sitchowski? Yes. Thank you. Okay, correspondence, communication update, Heather? Yep. Um, we had uh, not too long list this time, five emails since our last meeting. Uh, the first of which was um, a, kind of a belated one on the change the date to the select board that we were copied on. It was, the, the date was changed as we all know of the election. Um, two of them were uh, uh, questions and then follow up to them about basically structural materials of the building and then wiring plans. Um, one was a question on the slide decks, which if, in case everybody didn't see the answer, our slides are posted right on our homepage of cmsbuildingproject.org, so anybody can access them anytime. Um, and the last was uh, some relatively detailed suggestions um, about minor changes for significant impacts from our friend, Mr. Banfield. Um, oh, and then do you want me to do a quick just communication? Yeah, I to communication something. While I'm at it. Um, so we've been, um, we've had, I think there were more since our last meeting. We've had several coffees now and events with great turnouts, most of them. We only had one that was a, a meager two or three person turnout. The rest of them have been really good turnouts. Um, usually at least a dozen people. Um, our schedule is posted on our website as always. The one change I wanna mention is that we just added uh, another at the Council on Aging, specifically for Council on Aging members. So you won't see that in our public uh, promotion of events because they wanted to promote it just to the Council on Aging members. So it will be in the senior newsletter that gets sent out from them. Um, it, that goes out at the beginning. It's the January newsletter. I think it goes out before January um, with events there. So that is January 12th at 11 o'clock AM at Harvey Wheeler. Of course, anyone here is welcome to attend, um, but that will be promoted to Council on Aging members. And uh, we've also had a request from one of the PTGs to do a separate one for them. So we're, um, so we're working on scheduling that. Um, I think it's worth noting, Heather, who else, who's going to be joining? Oh. Thank you. Yes, at the one for the Council on Aging, um, Pat will be there as well as Bob. Am I going to get his name right? Lalesher. 
um, who is the, his title is still interim finance director, even though we have Gail out as the finance director now, but he's the finance person who has been doing, um, presenting most on the tax implications. And so he's going to be there as the tax expert to really help the Council on Aging members understand the tax implications of the project and of, well, particularly of the vote for the incremental funds. Um, let's see what else that's. Basically, that's it for change. I'm not going to go everything through everything we're doing because we've done it before, but that's it for changes. Alexa, am I missing anything else? I think. Okay. Uh, Charlie, you have your questions? Hand? Yeah. Are these questions about communications? I had a comment about uh, Dean Banfield's uh, letter. I, I'd like to put in a placeholder, if I can, for us to come back and discuss those suggestions, perhaps under the alt delete part of the meeting if we have time. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think that's that's an acceptable thing to do. Don, Steve. Yep. Thanks, Pat. I have two things. One, I want to publicly thank the select board for changing the um, date. Uh, I think that's happened since our last meeting. Um, I'm just checking my facts here. February 16th now is the ballot vote, if I'm not mistaken. So. Thank you to Matt and the rest of the select board. And I also want to thank the League of Women Voters who had us. This is related to, you know, it, it was more of a coffee because it was one of their first Fridays. But we were there maybe a couple weeks ago, almost two weeks ago. Um, and that was recorded, I believe. So I think that's available for those who missed it. But um, just want to thank them as well. So more of a thanks to two major groups in our town who have, um, you know, worked with our committee. Thank Thanks, you. Don. And I just Very wanted good to point. say Thank you, Don. the Concord Bridge got the article quite wrong. <laughs> so <laughs> we noticed it's that. worth <laughs> noting that we did change the date. And, and Al Alexa, it was you. Alexa sent a correction to them, right? Yeah, it was funny, though. They didn't actually have a corrections email. It was on their website. So don't send um, to that email. It's not active. But I oh. think they've since taken it down. Um, and they did issue a correction, albeit it was, you know, little. Yeah, minimal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's okay. They're working on it. Yeah, they're they're a new baby. They're they're they've got some some good work to do. Yeah. All right. Um, OPM update. Ian, you're on. Great. Thank you, Pat. Um, so there's a few things that we wanted to update you on before we get into the bulk of the discussion on uh, deduct alternates here. So let's go through it. All right, so uh, I just wanna go through cash flow update schedule recap, just to make sure we're all calibrated and on the same page there. Um, talk about a structural peer review of the prequal process and then get into the alternates here. So I'll try and jump through these fairly quickly. Um, so as far as cash flow, <clears throat> this is our current cash flow um, through the month of December. Uh, this accounts for th these um, actual expenditures of 402, 048 account for SMMA's uh, November invoice and Hill's November invoice. Um, so that's what those values are there. And uh, we're continuing to, to track things as we go here. So. Uh, this is the chart, the, the graph uh, you'll see. As far as a schedule update, just wanted to, um, we sent the full, the full schedule update. We kind of did a, a refresh um, this month and just wanted to, to go through that. Not, not, nothing substantial changed here. So, but just wanted to make sure that we're thinking about next milestones, uh, upcoming milestones here. So um, the design team is is still charging towards a 90% CD uh, submission. Um, so we've, we actually have the estimate set coming out this, uh, this Friday, and uh, that'll be in the hands of the estimators. Uh, Hill will be reviewing it. Uh, the commissioning agent will be reviewing it. So we'll start to review those drawings as well as we're doing estimating. Um, we'll have a cost estimate by January 10th, just trying to leave room for 
uh, people to enjoy the holidays and still get their uh, deliverables done. Um, we have a reconciliation uh, meeting following that, and we'll have a reconciled estimate by the 13th of January, which is consistent with what we had talked about before. So, and how that ties out um, to the to the bid is, you know, we need to have a 100% bid package by uh, February 27th. So, any um, final comments or or uh, updates need to be done for the bid package by February 27th. Uh, on the bidding front, um, this is our, our bid schedule um, that we've laid out here. So um, just advertising and, and getting the, the documents out uh, to the bidders by March 8th. Uh, we'll have a pre-bid conference and then we'll allow for a nice long duration for the filed sub bids uh, for uh, 20 days and the GC duration of 30 days. Um, for them to prepare their bids and and put in uh, put in uh, their bid uh, by um, the filed sub bids are due the fourth the general bids are due the nineteenth so um, and then we would we would review and make an award thereafter so and that's where we're headed um, as far as the bid process and then this is kind of an an overlay of the town process. Um, Everything grayed out has been done to this point, I believe. Um, so we're just uh, marching towards uh, the special town meeting and the vote um, updated the, the vote date to the 16th of February. So, so this doesn't have all quite all of the milestones, but just some of the major ones. Um, the next thing, next thing that we've been working on is uh, procuring a, a structural engineering firm to do a structural peer review. This is something that uh, we would typically do on projects um, just to have a second set of eyes on this, the structural design. Um, so you would hire a, a, a firm to do a peer review. Uh, we went out to five different firms that, um, that we worked with before. Uh, that we've had positive experiences with, uh, Goldstein Milano, EDG, DM Berg, Consultants, Foley and Buell, and Sousa True and Partners. Um, we received five proposals back, um, evaluated those, and have ultimately uh, are making a recommendation to award to Sousa True and Partners. Uh, they were all very similarly priced. Um, we just felt most comfortable with their, with their proposal and um, the way that they uh, understood the project, um, so it's a it's a small uh, value here, eighty five hundred dollars um, that we just use sound business practices for procurement, um, and uh, we would just prepare an amendment for for Hill. Uh, this would fall under our um, our per, our purview. So um, we'll be looking to get them to review the ninety percent set. Uh, when it comes out next week. So quick update on that. The uh, pre-qualification update. So um, everything's been going really well so far. Um, the, um, the qualifications were due um, on December 5th. So we received all of those. We received 95 um, statement of qualifications. Um, there were three that we had to disqualify because they were missing critical documents or, or it was a late submission. Um, there's one package that needed to be re-advertised for the filed, filed sub-bidder and that's the elevators. Um, that's been pretty typical. Um, but this is, this is the big list of all of the subs, the general contractors and subs that uh, are wanting to be pre-qualified for this project. So we have to do all the, all the due diligence to make sure that uh, these firms are, are qualified to, to bid on the job. So um, the, the most important here are the general contractors. So um, Hill did a, a ton of due diligence over the, the last several months. Peter Martini made a lot of phone calls. We did a lot of outreach to general to the general contracting community. Um, we probably reached out to you know, 12, 12 to 15 different general contractors to generate interest. 
Um, ultimately, we have we have five that um, are wanting to be pre-qualified. So um, we'll go through that process. And if if all five pre-qualify, then those would be who are bidding on this project. So a lot of familiar names for the design bid build world. Um, Agostini Bacon, Brait Builders, CTA Construction, Fontaine Brothers, and WT Rich. Um, so those are the those are the general contractors. I think we've got a really good pool of general contractors uh, interested in the job. Yeah, Ian, can I ask you? Um, out of the that group, are these all contractors that have built projects like ours? Um, anyone stand out? No, you can't say anyone stands out, but are they, do they have the experience that we're looking for? Are we? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I believe so. I mean, that's, that's the process that we need to go through here, you know, okay. so. They've all built schools in Massachusetts, public schools. I know every single one of them. Okay, yeah. thank you, Doc. Yeah, yep. that's comforting. Matt, do you, do you have a question? I, I do quickly. Thank you, Ian. So th this is the list, right? It, it will definitely be one of these five. Um, this is the, this is who has submitted statements of qualification. We need to make sure that everyone meets the, the, the standard that we're looking for here. This list could be smaller than this. If someone were to be dis, you know, disqualified, mm -hmm. then we would, you know, we might have four or th three, you know, whatever, whatever we decide as, as a committee, um, but it's not going to be anything bigger than this. So it's going to be at, you know, this, this or less. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then these are all the subcontractors. Ian, if I might, just for Matt's question, just so everyone understands, if you haven't been through the public procurement process, if you don't submit during the time frame that the submission was open, you don't get to bid on the job. So you know, first everyone has to submit. That's what this is. This is the, the initial whoever submitted. From here, there's a, the qualification committee goes through it. Some may drop off, some may stay. But if you're not on this list, you cannot submit a bid for either the GC or any of the file submits that are stipulated by Mass General Law. Okay. Yep. And yep. Lorraine, uh, or, or Ian, in the unlikely event, I'm sure it's very unlikely, but in the unlikely event that uh, you go through all of the contractors and none of them are up to snuff. Do you go back out with a, a pre-qualification process? Yes, I mean, it, that's a very unlikely event just because yeah. we know them and they are the, the traditional players. Okay. Um, but yes, we would, we would have to go back out. Okay, all right. Heather? Um, just quickly, is this a typical amount that you would have at this stage? Is is that to be expected? Yeah. Okay, great. Yep. Yeah, Thanks. it's a pretty typical amount. Okay. Um, so as far as you know, what what happened so far as far as disqualification, we had some mandatory documents that were missing on the fire protection front by J Johnson Controls. Um, we had a few late submissions with. Uh, masonry waterproofing and miss metals so these these three firms didn't meet the deadline for submission and then as i mentioned before we have to re-advertise the elevators and that process has already already started so peter yeah just quickly um ian and you might you may be getting to this ian but uh, these are the subcontractors that are required by the state to be filed subcontractors and the low bids get attached to the contractor's bids unless the contractor excludes them. But you'll see on here that uh, there's a lot of trades that are here and those are gonna be under the um, uh, general contractor who the general contractor wants to use and they include those in their bid. You'll notice you don't see concrete here. You don't see site, you don't see steel, you don't see any carpentry trades, uh, et cetera. So just so you know, there's a lot of other subcontractors that'll be uh, required and they will be um, at the discretion of the general contractor. Yep, that's a good point. Thank you, Peter. Um, so as far as timeline and next steps here, we're at 
the evaluation process. Um, we just met as a as a prequal committee. Um, I think it was earlier this week, Monday, and uh, talked through uh, next steps um, and division of labor. And uh, so we're really digging into these packages and starting to to review them. Um, we'll continue to do that. Uh, we've got a nice uh, long duration to do that um, through February. Um, and ultimately, we want to be able to make prepare a final report to this committee and uh, make a recommendation on February 9th. Um, and then, uh, you know, upon acceptance, we'll notify all the all the contractors and subcontractors thereafter. Um, and that lines up nicely with our our bid process. So we want to have that wrapped up by mid mid February, so that we're ready to bid in March. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to start out the deduct alt discussion with a cost recap. So we made some the committee made some decisions the last meeting. Um, to put things back into the project and show them as deduct alts. So um, that's all that this is this is doing here. So this VM accepted value back in, um, sorry, in, in um, November was uh, 389. Um, so those, those two items, uh, the wood panel ceilings and the bleachers were added back in. So this went down to 110. Uh, realized savings as for value management, uh, which brought the construction total to 86, 344, 749, and the overall total to 108.6 uh, million. And uh, so that's all that this is reflecting here. So just showing the difference in values here. This is the budget. This is where we're at with value management accepted. And then the Warren is at uh, 110 currently so so to kind of frame up this discussion and we, we started talking about it already but you know essentially what we want to do here is we want to identify any scope that can be removed um, or changed um, from the project if necessary so we want to have a, a safety net in place on bid day, um, if there's an overrun beyond um, the the bid numbers or the sorry the the, the budget, in which will will be included in the warrant article for construction, uh, we want to we want a means to get back to budget, and so that's that's the exercise here for deduct alts. Um, it's additional safety net beyond you know where we're at with the estimate versus the the warrant article. So we've we already have kind of a 1.3 million dollar safety net there um, of estimate versus warrant article um, but this is just to provide an additional safety net of that so um, two two things that we want to do with these deduct alts is we want to be able to have the estimators um, provide an updated estimate for these for these items um, and that's going to start next week so we want to we want to be able to put these items in front of the estimators and have them re-estimate them so we know what current values are for the deduct alts, current estimates are for the deduct alts. Um, and ultimately, SMMA needs to document these uh, changes in the drawing. So they're gonna draw it, they're gonna draw it um, one way and that's gonna be in the bid package, but they're also gonna draw it another way um, to show the deduct alts and uh, inform the bidders that they need to put a price to um, these changes. So we need to have that well documented for the bid package. Um, and that's due on February 27th. So um, we do need to, to make decisions and, and be able to um, inform both the estimators and SMA how to, how to proceed at this point. So um, we received feedback from from three individuals on the committee, um, SMMA and Hill kind of sorted sorted through those um, and thought about fe feasibility and the ability to to um, change design elements at this point in time. And so, what what we got out of that list is this um, 
this um, this pared down list here, um, two of which we've already talked about, which is the the wood look ceilings and the bleachers. Um, there was a a thought to take out the outdoor classroom construction. Um, so we don't have an estimate for that, but that was a, an idea. Uh, rough in speakers in the classrooms was one of the um, basically a deferred scope item that was on the, the list of items that wouldn't impact the schedule. Um, and then we we kept the, the landscaping and, and uh, athletic field removal on that list as well. Um, but essentially, this is these these are the these are the three uh, responses that we received um, from Court and Heather and and Charlie. Um, sorry to put you guys on on the spot here, but um, just wanted to to be transparent and show all the responses that we got. Um, so we tried to res respond to these and provide some feedback on on these items. So the first one was the outdoor classrooms. Which we thought was was okay to pursue, um, wouldn't impact the schedule. Um, the second item here is to seek savings in the subsurface of the athletic fields. Um, if I'm understanding it correctly, I think the idea is to move the savings to irrigation, which is not currently not in the project, so um, just not following how the savings would be realized if we're just moving money from one, one front to the other. Um, so we can certainly talk through that a little more. Um, removing uh, the AV from the band room, um, you know, is something that would have to be completely rescoped in order to strip that from the job. So we thought it would impact the schedule. Um, moving computers to FF and E um not fully understanding how how the savings would be realized there as well um and i don't i don't believe there's much in the way of scope uh, correct me if i'm wrong lorraine but for computers in the in the construction no documents there's none okay um Heather had some thoughts just about fields and other outdoor elements, which is kind of consistent with what our recommendations were the last time that we met. Um, Charlie had some ideas about, I guess, more of a comprehensive list of, uh, you know, the two items that we talked about before, the rough end classroom, rough end speakers in the classrooms, which is what was on uh, the list for not impacting the schedule. And then, um, some ideas on um, reducing sound systems and AV uh, lighting and and uh, you know auditorium curtains and rigging, and so this again is uh, things that would need to be completely rescoped and rethought through, um, which would impact um, the schedule. And trying to go back and, and rescope these items with user groups and have SMMA document them um, at this point in time uh, would be a challenge to, to maintain schedule. So, and then the last item was just the, the athletic field. So we we wanted to put these out there and, and provide a response and certainly talk talk through them more this morning. But that was kind of the starting point uh, for this morning's discussion. So, Ian, if um, if my math is correct, the the difference between well, the the total of the deduct alternates that that SMMA and and Hill are proposing is a little over two million dollars. Is my math right? Well, we don't know what the outdoor, outdoor classroom construction might add to that, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's over. It's over two million. Okay. Put that into context. Okay, so I think we are um, at the point of uh, asking for some comment or questions. Um, Charlie, I know you wanted to 
incorporate some comments. Heather, I see your hand up. Um, I think our goal is to, um, as Ian has requested, make a, a decision we will include as deduct alternates so that the designers can design, create the, those design changes to be submitted um, for estimation. Did I get that right, Ian? Yeah. Yeah, we want it. We want the estimate. Whatever the list is, we want to finalize it. We want to give it to the estimators, have them estimate it, and have estimate made document it. And then estimate and that, it's the time to document it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Heather. Um, thanks. I wanted to just quickly clarify first on my comment. Um, so it, as it showed, my comment was we should consider fields. Um, that was kind of dependent on something. So I've heard that there has been discussion at the school committee of um, potentially, and I don't know the status on this, so you guys can update me, Court and Alexa, if I'm wrong on this. Um, I thought there was discussion of potentially having a warrant article in the annual town meeting for fields or outdoor work or you know grounds or something. All right, I'm gonna get so something. if that's the plan and a possibility, then I would advocate for, you know, fields or grounds as a deduct alt. So I just wanted to kind of put that out to clarify. Um, so that my point is not to not do them, it's to do them a different way. And then secondly, that then just kind of a big, before we get into debating specific ones, I didn't mean to dive right into debate that, just to clarify. I had a big picture question for, um, I don't know, Ian, Lorraine, whoever might have insight on this. And I know that the answer will be somewhat subjective, but I'm just curious in terms of making a list of deduct alts, when you give a, when you send out a bid package with deduct alts, if you have a, a lot of them, let's say a long list and many deduct alt options, does it make it more likely that the bidders are going to come back with, you know, uh, I guess a higher bid, a bid that would be over our our goal budget because they assume that you have lots of options to bring it down. Is there anything, you know, is I don't know. I'm just wondering about kind of the psychology of this and if we should be thinking about the total number of deduct alts in the context of our discussion of each one. Yeah. I mean, you, you, there's certainly a strategy in in the deduct alts, and we talked about last time the the, the importance of the order of the deducts all alt, alts right. and how you have to take them in order. So their strategy with the ordering, their strategy with how many you put on there, um, because it is it is extra work in in the bid to to you know price these things out, um, and you don't you don't want to have too many of them where it's where it's intensive and you're you know they're they're just kind of. Um, you know, throwing throwing numbers at these things, um, and so you want to make sure that there's there's a the right right number of them, and and um, it's ordered properly so that you get good results back. Basically, I think there's another there's another feature to it from you know from what we've talked about with bidders after bids come in is that you you want to try and keep them discreet, and what I mean by discreet is. You don't want to have too many trades having pieces of an alternate. So I don't want it to affect the electrician, the HVAC guy, the painter, the ceiling guy for one alternate. It's nice if you can keep them to one or two trades. So, you know, the landscaping is a singular trade. The wood look ceiling is a singular trade. You know, what we put back there is important. So trying to keep it within their overall bucket so that they're looking at, I would provide you X or I would provide you why, but it's still what I would provide you as a singular trade. Once you start getting multiple trades, having pieces of an alternate, you lose the value and you don't end up getting your the best bang for your buck. Great, that's helpful, thanks. Sure. Okay, I might have other thoughts on specific things, but that was my high level, I'll let other people go for now. <laughs> Court, were you up next? Sure. Um, I, I hope that we tackle the athletic fields first because the cost is the most significant. Um, 
And I don't believe that uh, we should be uh, really discussing removal, but rather alternate funding. Um, Heather's mentioned one potential alternate funding, which has not uh, uh, gone beyond uh, a quick mention at a school committee meeting, uh, but there's also been discussion of other funding sources, uh, which we might want to consider in terms of its eligibility, CPA specifically. Um, in terms of the Cor, um, Cor, can I ask you a question or can I tease go dig a little sure, sure. so um I, I love the idea of alternate funding and there's a, a precedent in town for for having alternate funding for things like fields Lorraine if we if we didn't include the fields as a deduct alternate but we didn't get I'm trying to figure out the timing. I mean, the alternate funding is a, we wouldn't know for sure if we were going to have alternate funding. I don't know how you either include it or don't include it as a deduct alternate. If you're basing it on, you're going to get alternate funding for it. Pat, Pat before she weighs in, just to look at timing, um, uh, uh, a, a yet another warrant article could uh, occur in uh, at the April regular town meeting, as Heather said. I don't believe CPA funding would be available in fiscal 24 because their application period has already concluded, if I'm correct. So it'd be fiscal 25 were there to be CPA money such that we fund this without uh, changing the tax levy. So Ian, can you just remind me the date? I know the date the bids are due, but the date we were gonna award the contract, because that's when you have to make the decision on the alternates, because it can change who the bidder is. You know, Matt, because- Sorry. Matt, you may have something technical. May, May 23rd, okay. Uh, the, the third. May 3rd, excuse Not me. Not the 23rd, yeah. Thank you. May 3rd. So you could keep it in the project as a deduct alternate, but you'd have to, in order to be able to award the contract, you have to have the money to award it. So, you know, you need to know that you'd have the money, the funds available. Assume, then this is all, again, this is the premise that, you know, the bids are going to be high. So if the bids are high and you need to take the deduct alternate, the only way you'd keep it in is if there was additional funding and that additional funding would have to be known and, and guaranteed by the 3rd of May. So we could decide to include the deduct, the fields as a deduct alternate now, but by the 3rd week, we would know whether or not we need it, right? Yes. I mean, the schedule seems designed for that purpose, right? Because the award is the day after town meeting or the, the final day of town meeting. So, you know, it, it seems like the whole strategy of having a warrant article that could pay for any deduct alternate that was taken in order to meet the bid uh, you know, could be handled through that. But I just wonder again about that strategy that if bidders understand that we have a warrant article that's designed to make up that gap, that kind of gives them extra headroom in making, you know, a bid that cuts something, you know, cuts this stuff out, uses up all the money, and then asks basically for us to consume that money at town meeting through the warrant article that is uh, supposedly in the offing. I just wonder if strategically it just leads to higher bids. Um, you know, all of this stuff is, we know what we want to be in the project. It's, this is not VE, right? This is now just trying to meet no. a, a bidding amount. So I, I would like to just focus on how we get to a bid amount efficiently 
you know, through this deduct alt process and all the other stuff. I, you know, again, whether we want to take it or not, I mean, it's really we we're only going to take any of this stuff if we have to to meet the bid. I I, I would I would echo that. That's our goal is to move ahead with the project. Um, very quickly, Pat, just to finish up on my comments. Um, when I considered computers, I did it because I think computers are an FF and E item, not because they're a five year lifespan consumable. Uh, and uh, to the point that it wouldn't run, uh, result in any savings. Well, it would if we looked for savings elsewhere in FF and E to treat it as uh, FF and E. Um, uh, next item is outdoor classrooms, and uh, I'm never suggesting that we don't have outdoor classrooms, rather that most schools use uh, the natural terrain very, very effectively uh, without uh, outdoor construction that is significant. Um, so we certainly wouldn't be abandoning our commitment to, to outdoor classrooms. Uh, I think that's, that's it on my suggestions. Thank you. Charlie? John. Yeah, I, I just uh, not sure when we want to discuss the we're talking about fields when we want to discuss the issue of the of the irrigation and potentially changing the the nature of the of the design, the design itself. And maybe that's maybe that's for later in the discussion this morning. But I thought the suggestion was a good one. And, um, you know, if this is a last chance to make those changes, we should note that and and you know, work decide whether we want to do it or not. Um, I think it's uh, unfortunate to have fields that don't have irrigation when, in fact, we know we think we know that we need it. And if we could, uh, in fact, you know, modify the the design of the fields to to accommodate um, uh, irrigation without changing the total cost simply by rejiggering the amount of gravel and the uh, geotextile uh, uh, factors, that might be, um, you know, a smart move, uh, you know, if we can justify that those changes are going to give us a good result. Um, so I, I guess I just put that out there. Maybe we want to discuss that later. Maybe we're going to discuss it now. We'd love to hear what your, what the comments are from Pat and Dawn on, on how to proceed. I just want to ask 978-831-2632, could you please mute? Um, I'm not sure how how to handle this. I, what we're, our goal today is to come up with a list of deduct alternates. And um, I did see Dean's suggestions. I don't know how feasible they are. I mean, one of the things that we were able to do was to go through the feasibility of the, the um, committee members' suggestions. Um, I don't know, Dawn, do you have a thought on what to do? This, this seems like it's, it's out of the scope of what we're trying to accomplish today. Um, I don't know how, changing the landscaping approach to the fields fits into this discussion. So I'm looking for some help. Well, just one comment, it may not fit in, but where, mm -hmm. where it could fit in and how it might fit in at some point before we get too far along to preclude it would be, I think the, the, the point that, that would be helpful or the answer that would be helpful. It may not be today that we wanna discuss this, but. I think we may want to discuss this and how would we do that in a, in a, in a way that's timely. I, I don't necessarily, I mean, it sounds like our committee wants to have a discussion about it. I'd like to hear from Mike Dowen about the composition of the fields and if what's in the current design is appropriate based on the subsurface and you know, what our, our community is looking for as far as fields is concerned. If you haven't had time to review that, Mike, then I'm not trying to put you on the spot, um, but it's, I'm not engineering it. It's not, a, you know, um, I can't speak to the validity of the design because I'm, I didn't design it. Uh, but I think Lori has previously said that, you know, she would 
find a way to get irrigation in the fields at a future date if that were in fact, you know, after the realization that it wasn't actually in the budget. Um, so uh, I think it's kind of a sidebar to what we're trying to do here. And I'm not against trying to get it into the project uh, in any way, but I also don't think that us sitting around spinning, talking about it without professionals weighing in on what they think as far as, you know, the geotextile fabric and all of that, I can't speak to that. So um, I would say if Mike can't give us input on that right now, um, I think I put you on that email, Mike, when I sent it around. Um, I would look to the professionals to weigh in on that. And yeah. if they have suggestions, Lorraine and team, yeah. sorry, Lorraine, I wasn't trying to sidestep you. Okay. I saw that Mike, no, no. Was, uh, Mike was yeah, on Mike there. is on today. Yep. Mike, can you, can you address the design of the fields, please? Sure. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Sorry, I'm, I'm traveling right now. So I want to make sure you guys can hear me. So the, 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 the soil, the, the athletic field profile is created like that for two reasons. Uh, Two, two main reasons, right? Um, playability, which is a direct correlation with permeability, right? So any kind, anytime you have a uh, natural turf field like this, most important element of it is to try to make it as playable and useful as possible. And, you know, we know what springs and falls are like around here in terms of rainfall volume. So what we try to do is we try to create a profile that allows as much um, water absorption as possible. So the thicker, the layer of topsoil is, and the thicker the depth of stone underneath it, the more uh, uh, the more water holding capacity the field has. Now uh, that's that's we, we see it, you know fields that have six inches of topsoil on top of a sub uh, on top of you know undisturbed subgrade everywhere, right? They're they're everywhere, all all over the place. Um, those also tend to be the kind of fields that, you know, as they get used, especially tracked during, you know, they get used during wet weather, that really has an impact on them. That's also why we use the, uh, the, the type of uh, the, the type of seed mix that we use when we have like the 90% bluegrass and 10% uh, rye that we kind of switch the, we kind of switch the, uh, the, the, the ratio from what you would see on a non-irrigated field because the uh, root systems of, uh, of of bluegrass absorb water much better and, and go a lot deeper and create a much more uh, a, a much more robust field uh, system that that sort of resists getting muddied up. So to summarize, you you can you can certainly reduce the amount of crushed stone or gravel underneath it. You can certainly reduce the amount of uh, uh, you know filter fabric. Filter fabric is there just to uh, prevent migration, uh, you know, and capillary action of the stone and the and the and the, uh, and the topsoil. You can do that. It's just again, it's an issue of permeability and playability. So you may not have as playable fields, especially in the spring, um, as you would get if you went with that full 12 inch uh, and 12 inch profile. Ho hopefully, that wasn't too nerdy. I apologize if it was. Now that that was very helpful to me. So, um, the, the the fields have been designed for maximum playability. They've been designed. It sounds like best practice for maximum playability. Uh, Lorraine That's if, or Michael, if we were to decide <clears throat> over the next few weeks that we don't we don't want to go for the that best practice or that standard. And we wanted to reduce it. Could we would could we make that change over time? That doesn't is it? Yeah. So what what we had talked about, um, Pat, is that we would hold the grades that are designed on the top. So everything below that section would would shrink up. But you know we wouldn't be changing the grades. Um, we're asking the estimators to give us a price to go to six and six and delete the geotextile fabric. So we'll have a better price. I think that you know that not to throw a spanner in the works as we say at home but like if you add the irrigation back into the discussion it probably changes some of mike's thinking as well because we were going on the basis of non-irrigated fields and making sure that they stay dry so they do have an interconnection to them um but your fields get such use you know these are not fields that are like 
a school field, a play field for recess. These fields are heavily used and you can see the wear and tear on them. So I think it's just an expectation and an understanding by this committee that, you know, those fields will need lots of maintenance just like they always have. So, but they will look like the fields you've always had. And, and if you're good with that, then that's your decision. And I think that's fair. You know, what Michael is trying to do is provide you a field that lasts longer for you. But, you, you know, you pay for that. So there's, it's all a matter of value. You know, what's the value to you? Um, so I, think I guess um, I, I want to put this in a parking lot. So I, I want to, you know, we can maybe discuss it over our, our next meetings if we want to continue discussing it. I just want to make sure that we can put it in a parking lot. We can put it in the parking lot, I would say, till the January meeting. Okay. You know, we're going to get the pricing so everyone will know the better pricing. But between the January meeting and the end of the set, Mike would need to know what we're putting in there. Is that fair, Mike? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, Charlie, I'm going to put this in the parking lot. Is that okay? That's, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry, uh, Pat, can I ask a quick question on the parking yeah. lot plan before you move on? <laughs> um, but just before we go, um, it, it, re regarding this and the irrigation, I think it's a very good point about irrigation. And unless, you know, everything Lorraine just said about the, and, uh, and Mike said about the underworkings negates it. It seems like irrigation would be a valuable goal to bring back in because we've had experiences at other fields in town where, you know, the Willard, Willard fields were just brown for years and awful until we added irrigation later. So my question, Mark, my question is in terms of putting things in the parking lot and because we've been just been talking about, oh, alternate sources of funding. If we found a way to fund irrigation that did not include these suggestions of taking away part of the underpinnings of the field fields. Is that something else that we could talk about in January and talk about somehow, you know, adding irrigation if we found some funding for it or something? I, not that I have funding in mind. I just want to see if that can be part of the discussion then. Because I'm looking, Lorraine, to you or. Yeah, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to understand what what Heather's suggestion was. I'm sorry. So, well, I, get, I don't know that it's a specific suggestion as much as I, in addition to, so this, what was suggested by Dean was a way to fund the irrigation, right? And if we as, a, maybe we as a committee will decide, yep, that's a good idea. We should do that. That's a good way to fund the irrigation. So that's one possibility. Yeah. If we decide, you know what, taking away the, the things, the, the parts of the underfield for the for the uh, drainage is not a good idea. We decide not to do that, but we decide we really think irrigation is important and we want to fund it somehow. Yep. yep. And it, and we can somehow find a way to fund yep. it. Can we? Can that be discussed in January? I just don't want to miss our window and get to January yep. and say, oh, well, you could have taken away part of the fields, but now it's too late to add irrigation. So so they're not they're while they're intertwined, they're not um, dependent on each other. Okay. The deeper section is still going to provide you a better field in the long run forever right. with the use of this field, even with irrigation. So I want to make sure that that's clear. Right. The irrigation has not been designed, period. So okay. there is a design time frame that is required for the irrigation system. Okay. And we would need to hire somebody. We don't do the irrigation design in-house. So we would need to hire somebody to design irrigation. Okay. So there's a little concern on my part, I would say, to try and get an irrigation system designed in that time frame. Okay. Um, so it's, it, I don't know how long it will take to design an irrigation system, um, but that's not something that we do in house. So um, I would need to get some more information on how long it takes, but they're, they're intertwined, but they're not, you know, you, if you do one, you don't necessarily take away the other. So. They're not interdependent, right? Exactly. Interdependent, thank you. Um, and is an irrigation system that something that we could, you know, add later, a year or two down the line? It's not efficient to do it that way, but how inefficient is it, I guess? Is that? A you could add it later. We often have clients who add it later. Um, okay. We often have clients who, who don't have it in the project or who add it later. Um, you know, I can talk to Mike and we can talk offline about how we could potentially get a price for it. 
um, so that we understand. I'm not sure, Mike, if we can do it as a delegated design um, and just put some criteria in a spec and then the, the irrigation contractor would bid on it. That might be an option. Uh, I, I was thinking the same thing. Um, okay. I was thinking the same thing, Lorraine. So we write some sort of performance yep. spec and okay. then uh, deal with it through the through the um, through the shop drawing process. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, That's I mean, really just, helpful. Thank you, guys. To, Sorry to be thrown this in. No problem. Just, just to put you at ease here for time, you know, you can always add this in at a, at a later date during construction. It's something that we could okay, issue a bulletin to the contractor. Um, you know, towards even even towards the end of the job and say, hey, you know, we changed our minds. We 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 funded money for irrigation. We've we want to do this. We want to proceed and we issue them a, a bulletin accordingly. And they proceed with, you know, like we were just talking about the de delegated design and uh, go through the shop drawing process and, and come up with a price for it that that's agreeable. And then we can have them proceed with it. And that can be, you know, through th during construction. Awesome. Thank you. That's helpful. Yep. Great. Peter. Yeah, real quick. I just wanted to let the committee know that I'm um, starting to have some conversations with the uh, community preservation group, because uh, I do think that getting funding for irrigation and some of the fields is definitely possible through that. So to have that as a uh, uh, as an option for us. Uh, I think makes sense, especially with something like irrigation that um, we could leave out and add in. And I'm pretty comfortable uh, that we could get some uh, funding from them for some of it. Uh, those of you guys who remember the turf field project, we had about 1.5 million from the community preservation group uh, as part of that funding. So uh, just a quick update. Thanks. Yeah. What's the ballpark estimate, so to speak, for doing irrigation? Is Don going to answer that? Uh -uh. <laughs> no, answer I, was gonna, I, I actually had my hand up because I was going to share a recent project. I don't even know how big square footage wise, Mike, and you probably don't know offhand what we're looking at as far as area to be covered. But in a recent project I did, we did irrigation and it was a dollar and a quarter per square foot and that I, was designed and built so i like a couple dollars a square feet safe yeah i would say Do yeah dollar fifty dollar sixty yeah. i'm seeing these days yeah. per square yeah. foot and Mike, do you i have apologize how much? yeah I, I was just gonna say I'm, I'm in my car so but my my recollection i can i can confirm this my recollection was that it was somewhere in the 200 thousand square foot range for the three fields that makes We're sense. I have a baseball. Roughly. Just How much I, think, I thought it was I thought it was in the four hundred thousand dollar ballpark oh. for total. Okay, you know, I'm gonna I think maybe we are gonna we're getting a little bit too deep into this. I, I think I'd like to go up a little bit. So it sounds like we don't have any irrigation in this project anyway. So that's not even it can't be a deduct alternate because it's not in the project anyway. It's not going to save us any money. But but we do know we can put it in at a later date. Pat, before you go, I just pulled yeah. up the estimate. It's 234,000 square feet for natural grass fields. That's just over the, pro the project I alluded to had 160,000. So and so if you take 234 times whatever, 1.6, then 16. you have a ballpark. Yeah, 370, 375. 375. So yeah. There you go. Sorry, Pat, but just in order of magnitude, just so everyone knows, I'm happy to move on. But yeah, but what I am wondering is if we if we think there could be we could put in reducing the um, playability of the fields. We could say we're going to choose to have less than optimal fields, and that will save X number of dollars. We can put that in as a deduct alternate and then possibly fundraise to improve those fields at the end of the pro somewhere along the line and is that and i don't even know how much that saves but if we're looking for savings um Brian, you want you're you're shaking your head and i 
Yeah, because part of the strategy for reducing the section of the field is that the top elevation doesn't change because all the grading is done. So we're, we're, we're lowering the section. So you're not going to build it up later in years because it'll change all your grading. Right, but you could, could you build it up? Could you decide you're going to build it up in, in May? You know, the, in, you know, if we, in May. no, it, could we, could we put it into the design later or it, it has, I mean, yeah, you, you do a change order. Yeah. You do a change order. That's right. You yeah. so it would be the bulletin again. Yeah. Bulletin yeah. Doing yes. So we could put it back. Yeah. And it is phase two. So that helps you. Yeah, it gives us more time to figure out if we if we can afford, if if the committee decides it wants to take that risk and have less than optimal fields. Yes. Steve. So the discussion is about um, deduct alternates, and I've been thinking if you know there's five general contractors, they're going to want to build the building as efficiently and to to get the project, they need to bid the project uh if you know competitively and it seems like the fields have some pretty good discussion still to be had about what that final design is going to be um and i'm just trying to put a lot of thoughts in my head together here um if we say reduce the number of speakers in the classroom that that could be interpreted by the bidders in three different ways, five different ways. And we really don't know, <clears throat> unless we have a really tight design on that in the next 30 days, uh, 60 days. Um, you know, I, I think we have a great risk of getting not what we want if we change things, you know, sort of like haphazardly. And I, there will be thought put in that. I'm not saying that there's, you know, not professionals on this on the SMMA team to make that design as as tight as possible to get good good numbers on our deducts. But I could see that those deducts that we aren't really thinking, you know, these four or five at the top, they could really sway the bid, and they could be a hundred thousand dollars. They could be two hundred thousand dollars, and you know, we might not know what we're getting. Um, and then when you think about when the bids do come in there, we've got $110 million to work with. I mean, if we're 110.2, you know, or 110.3, that that's so tight. I would think if, uh, you know, if the one alternate that we were considering was the fields, that's something that we have funding, you know, in mind uh, and further design discussions that probably should happen. Uh, so that we're sure we're getting what we want on those fields. And I mean, frankly, it's a 2025 installation, 2026 installation. We have a little bit of time to figure out what exactly that design looks like, what exactly, you know, the funding looks like. Um, and I, I think it might be wise of us to consider that as our number one deduct to say, if we're, if we're anything over 110, let's, let's scrape that back out. Um, and it gets us to where we would need to be, I would think. I mean, if we're 100 and, you know, 111.5, I don't know. I, I think I'll stop right there. I think my recommendation is going toward the direction of just having the fields as the number one. And I know that's contrary to what we talked about last time, but um, I think it's a nice thing to take out. It's something that we can focus on. Uh, with time, we can get what we want, and we can fund it appropriately, and it moves us move the project ahead without a lot of what ifs and unknowns about the others. Yep, I it, it might be a good that those are really good thoughts, Steve. Thank you. Um, it might be a good opportunity to kind of look at bid these bid scenarios that we talked about last time, just so we have a a, a good understanding of what we're talking about on on bid day. So um the again this is so we've got a few safety nets in place here we've got the, the first one is the bin contingency of two, of two million dollars um the second one is the the value between um the current estimate and the the 110 million um and then the third would be the the deduct alts so um you know this is 
that's that's two two million plus one point three plus whatever you take for deduct alts for for an an overrun here. So um, this for the you know this is the current article here of one hundred and ten, um, and that's sorry that's one that's one point six over um, the CD estimate. Um, utilizing the big contingency, you know, you can take a bid up to up to 89.7 million. That's 3.6 million over the big contingent, the sorry, the 60% CD estimate, which is um 4.3% higher, which is kind of that area that we're I'm sorry, seven 11% over the construction budget. So that's that's um much more what over what we're seeing for um, actual bids, uh, July and October, and um, you know this is utilizing the the deduct alts that were proposed before, which was the the first one we thought of was the fields because um, it's something that would be easy to to defer and, and bring back through fundraising or other means later on the project that would give you another. 1.5 million and then the, the the other idea on top of that was the landscaping so that's the that uh comprises the one 1.8 1 million so that gives you a, a 5.4 million dollar cushion um from what we're estimating at, the, at that point use utilizing those those three things so that's a pretty pretty substantial cushion here Thanks, Ian. Yep. I'm not seeing any other hands up for discussion. And I'm wondering if we are at a place now where we can agree on, if somebody wants to make a proposal for an order and a, li a list of deduct alternates that we would give to the designers in order of preference. I nominate Steve to make a suggestion. He was better, it sounded very knowledgeable. But Matt's got his hand up. <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> Well, all I wanted to do was before we drilled into that further is to discuss the outdoor classroom construction a little bit further. First of all, it would seem to be, and again, I'm speaking from a layman's perspective, aligned with the kinds of things we're talking about doing with the fields in that it's, you know, outdoor work. It's, uh, and so, and I don't have a sense again of order of magnitude of the the potential savings there, but it it does sound like an interesting uh, option I uh, hadn't you know considered it before um, and it does seem like something that could potentially be added later uh, if it was decided to add later um, I just want to understand you know first of all from the architects as well as from you know our our PM um, that OPM that what is what would be involved with doing that and would that be worth putting right after the fields in terms of something that would be related you know same trades or so forth to to implement or not implement i should say yeah so this is one that came in as a recommendation um we would not do any of the seating or the walkways at the back um i'm just trying to pull up the grading plan while i'm talking about it Mike's still on, um, and I think it would just be graded back there in grass. Uh, it's pretty much singular trades. It's it's a lot of it is landscaper because it's some pre gas seating and grading and lawn. Uh, we did have the out uh, the lighting and the outlets, and I think we took one of those away. If I remember correctly. Uh, I think we took the lighting away. Did do you so, want to put this up, Lorraine, just so we can take a look at it? Yeah. So what we're talking about is, can everyone see my screen? And what we're talking about is roughly this area here. 
So, um, so we would take away the benches, the grading, the plot, you know, what is essentially, you know, hardscape through here. You know, this is all, this is all hardscape through here. And then this is the three classrooms and there's a walkway that connects around. So we'd get rid of all of that. I, I assume. The, the materials, what are the materials through there again? Uh, this is concrete. I think it's concrete. Mike, I don't know if you're still on. Um, but we'd get rid of that. There'd be no reason for it. And this would just be graded out, you know, similar to how this is graded adjacent to it. So it would not be handicap accessible then, just so people know. So it would not be used um, because these are quite steep, these slopes. So we'd be tying back into the existing grading here. So I, I assume that is the intent is that we just tie in the existing grades back here and you don't do any of that level area, any of the plaza, any of the seating. Um, and, and you just said that that would make the um, outdoor classroom concept not accessible. Right, because you have to do grading to get a, an accessible route back there, which is what these, these walks do. They, they're graded down at one and 20 to provide an accessible route behind the school because the classroom has to be accessible right. once you put it there. But if the classroom is gone, is there a need for it to be accessible, I guess is the question, because it's just it's just grass. Well, I think there could be a need because it might be built out in the future. I mean, I guess the question is, does that eliminate most of the cost benefit or not to grade it flat there? Right. I mean, that's what we can get priced, right? That's one of the things we can ask our estimators to give us a price on because we hadn't discussed this previously. So I guess the, the alternative is, you know, stone dust, which often you see for infields, they, you know, that is considered an accessible material. So we could look at just grading a level area and bringing a stone dust path through here, not providing what we've got there. We just need to give the estimators some guidance on what is yeah, the I mean, that sounds like a plan, an approach. Well, is, is it handicapped accessible if it's just grass, if it's level? No. No. It's level? no. no. It has to be it, stable. it cannot be grass, okay. No. Stone stable slip resistant is the language in the code. Yeah, I don't think any, I think that the, the suggestion on the table in court, you can um, correct me if I'm wrong, is not to do away with the concept of an outdoor classroom but to not um you're looking for some savings in the construction of that outdoor classroom and if we want to maintain the concept of the outdoor classroom it has to be accessible well i'll, I'll tell you i was greatly influenced uh, in my recommendation to reconsider this by the school districts that i've worked with uh, since the onset of the pandemic, I've worked with uh, easily dozens of different school districts uh, who wanted to move some of their instructional activities outdoors and had to use found space. And uh, there were a lot of wonderful creative solutions. Um, school districts didn't find themselves greatly uh, uh, restricted when they started to look at their property and how students could, could use it. So I, I think... Uh, that's the, the primary reason that I had confidence in bringing this forward as an idea. And, and we saw that too, Court, with some of our clients. I think one of the, one of the uh, unspe unspoken issues might be that schools made use of what they had. They may not necessarily be handicap accessible. And because we're building this, we have to design it to code. What, what happens after we've left the building? we can't control, but as designers, we cannot by no, code I, show something that does not meet code. I, I understand that, but when we do look at outdoor use by students, I think we have to look at the property in its entirety. Um, this would not be the only place that a group of students could congregate. It just has to be accessible, Court. It would always have to be accessible. That's correct. And I think right. that we have other uh, other areas, fields included, uh, that will be accessible, if I'm correct. So I'm just saying there are opportunities we don't see in this particular picture. That's, that's the point. All right. I'm going to work my way backwards. Alexa.
You're on, you're on mute. Yes, you're muted. Um, I just wanted to make sure that I'm following correctly. So if we were to reduce this from the scope, do we, at least for the foreseeable future until we would get some sort of later alternative funding, this, we would, we would not, we might be able to preserve the site if you will, available uh, ability to be handicapped accessible, but it wouldn't be in this scope. So you sort of are therefore eliminating for the foreseeable future, this, the ability for this particular area to be used for outdoor classrooms. Does, am I making sense? Yeah, but what I heard, and correct me if I'm wrong, one of the things that we would ask the estimators to do, and I apologize for my beautiful drawing here, but we would provide a stone dust path through here and where I have the oval very crudely drawn, provide a leveled graded area. Okay. Do so you so kind of get a single outdoor classroom kind of feeling? Just an air, it would, it would not really be defined except that we would provide the graded um, stone dust path through it so that you could access through it. Okay. And you, the rest you would be maintain, grass. You wouldn't maintain concrete no. through there? I assumed that there'd be no concrete. That's why, because otherwise you're not getting the savings. So I understood, and maybe I misunderstood. That no, that's, just... that's the idea. Great, okay. great <laughs> flat, have the stone dust path through it so that you could rather, first of all, maybe accommodate more informal outdoor classrooms in the interim. And then secondly, it could be without a significant cost, uh, be converted to the more formal outdoor classrooms later. That's the idea, that's the theory. Okay. Heather? Um, thanks. Okay, so three things which I will just say quickly first and then go back. So summary first, um, this discussion about creating a space that is that is for use somewhat, but not accessible in the short term makes me very uncomfortable. I don't think that's a path we should be looking at um, to create a somewhat usable space that's not accessible. It's, not, that's, it's just not in line with what we it, all It said. would be accessible, Heather. I thought we just said the stone dust path is not. No, stone dust is accessible. Oh, it is. Grass. Okay, sorry. Stone dust is. I stand corrected. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I misunderstood that then. Um, the second, so my second thing is a question. If we were to do this and then come back and say, okay, now we want to create the out actual outdoor classrooms that we've all decided are a good idea. Um, is it more of a cost to do it later? Because it feels like we're talking yes. about grading. Yes, and therefore, once the building is built, you have to come back. You have to bring machines and creating things back in when they're not already there. It feels like we're talking about bumping it down the road a little bit and spending a lot more to do it, which doesn't, I don't think makes any sense. So is that, is that accurate? Or are you yes, that? it would cost more later. Yeah. Okay. I mean, while you have the machines digging foundations and doing stuff, they would form it up. While you have a concrete truck there, bringing the, just, you know, getting a concrete truck back here later. Right, is, right. You know, different. So okay. it would so be less. It would be less efficient, and okay. therefore it would cost you more. So that's my biggest concern here. Really, is that it will either a cost us more money, or b will never get done because it's going to cost more money. Um, so I think this is a very risky thing to put on the alt deduct. And my third thing is just to ask. I would like to know the educators' take on this, particularly Lori. If Lori's here, I can't see everybody. I think Lori had to step off. Okay. Something. Okay. So so can, all right. So let me jump in and Great. summarize. The outdoor classrooms were part of the original design, and they they are part of the ed plan use of outdoor classrooms. So this does infringe to some extent on the ed plan. What I believe is being um, considered is just like with the fields, we would make the choice to have a less than optimal outdoor classroom in order to save some money. And we don't know what that money would be. Um, just like the fields, we'd have less than optimal fields, but we would save some money. And so I think that 
that's going to be the decision that the uh, the, the committee is asked to make as we go into these deduct alternates. These are, this is not value engineering. We're not taking them out of the project at this point, but we would consider not implementing them into the project if we don't have enough money. Yeah, that's what I was going to focus on is that this is not a question of taking it out of the project. The, the alternative to taking this out of the project, if it came to that, would be we wouldn't have a, a project because <laughs> we wouldn't be able to meet the budget. The only time this would be taken out is if we otherwise wouldn't meet the budget to be able to build. And I think but there are other things that we could, just to respond to that, Matt Seller, since it was my point, there are other things that we could take out if needed that could be replaced at a similar cost versus at a higher cost. Well, I guess which are those? I, I, we haven't gotten to the ordering discussion yet. This is just right, right. whether it's on the list. Right. Yeah. Well, we haven't gone through the items yet either. So we ought to finish that. Is that, I'm, I'm going to call on you now, Charlie. Is that what the point? Well, you I, yeah. I mean, that, for example, I mean, I don't want to switch the topic mm -hmm. off these outdoor classrooms, but, but uh, you know, the landscaping was in for 300,000. And I assume that's, continues to be in as a alt deduct. Uh, if, if people don't want to include that as an alt deduct, that's that's certainly okay, but it's $300,000 of, uh, you know, where we can reduce our risk if the project runs over. Um, you know, I, I would also comment that on the trees, uh, a lot of those trees are are planted in between the, the uh, uh, solar canopies. Now we don't have a final commit on the solar canopies yet, but if those solar canopies do go in, it's doubtful that you would want to have trees growing between those canopies and then shading the, the, uh, the, the you know, the solar panels. I, I would assume that would be a concern, but uh, I, you know, I, I certainly think the trees is a good topic. It's a good, it's a good alt deduct. It's clean. It doesn't require a bunch of trades. Um, I think we ought to continue with that one. Just Charlie, I don't know what set you were looking at with the trees, but we have since coordinated with the solar company, so there are no trees between the solar panels. Oh, okay. Well, I would still That's say correct. that the through trees is still probably a good alt deduct because you could plant trees later, presumably. And that's unless, in the unless you don't want to include that, it was it was included from the last meeting, so. Yep. So just to clarify for everybody, we had put in landscaping because it is one of those things you can come and do later, with the exception of any plants within the bioretention area, because those are actually a functioning element. And we won't get our filtration if we don't do those plants. So the bioretention plants would remain always in the project. And the deduct was was for everything other than that. So mm -hmm. I, I hadn't seen the, the new plan. So that's that's good that you changed it. I appreciate that. Right, Anne, can you pull up the, the, the list that we're working from now that has been recommended? Yeah. Um, and, uh, unless there's more discussion, I think I'd, I'd like to ask for someone to put forward a motion so that we can then discuss that motion. Steve? I move to use the athletic fields as the deduct alternate that we would consider if the project were over budget with the expectation that alternate funding would be sought out. So you're moving that we only consider right now the athletic fields. Do you want to give it a priority place in the discussion or? Yeah, number one, I, I like, like I said, I think that's the best place to focus if we really run into trouble. 
I'll second the motion. Any discussion? Do we need to uh, put all of them in order or is it okay to just say one and we're gonna forget about the others? Well, that's the motion that I got. I would love someone to give us a motion of the, the list in order that we could chew on, but um, the, the, but the, the motion on the floor is just to, to decide that removing the athletic fields would be number one. And Lorraine, correct us if uh, they have to be in order, do they not? Yes. They have yes. to be in order, but we don't need you to order them today, Good. just so you know. What, oh, we need, okay. what, would be, what we need today is what's in so we can work with the estimators to get the right pricing. Yep. To, to answer Peter's question, you could you, you can do whatever you like. You can choose to have one um, deduct alt, and that could be the field only. You don't have to add any of these other ones to the deduct alt list. So you can have one, you can have three, you can have five, you can have however many, but just wanted to answer the question. So then I'm in agreement with Steve. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Alexa, you have your hand up. Well, I'm just wondering, could we <clears throat> could we move to add them in order one by one so that they are separate motions? Like, do we have to consider them all at once or can we take, can we vote on Steve's motion and then potentially add something else after that would be considered number two and then so on? That was we, we certainly can and we can do yes and it, from what uh, Lorraine just said we could just give her a list of what we will consider as deduct alternate they'll come back to us with the uh, make sure I've got this right they'll come back with the estimates on what the values of those deduct alternates are and at that point we can order them yes okay uh, Okay, Heather, you had your hand up and then Matt. Sorry, I think my question was answered, but I like Alexa's idea of doing them, looking at them one at a time. Okay, Matt. I think it'd be prudent to have a all-inclusive list of potential deduct alternates at this stage to be explored so that when we come back in January, we, we will have the 90% estimate at that point, right? So if we then come back and we see that we've got a budget problem, we're going to need, I think, to specify additional deduct alternates. But if we haven't explored them to understand what the opportunity is, we won't at that point be able to put them on the list and we could be stuck. So, I, you know, especially if we don't have to order the list today, I think what all we have to do today is say, what's on the list and i would suggest to be inclusive rather than exclusive at this stage so that we know all the stuff we've got to work with okay so we have a motion on the table to accept the athletic fields as a deduct alternate and i think we got a second on that um we're not ordering it we're just accepting the the athletic fields as a deduct alternate. So is there any more discussion? I actually have a question, Pat. Yeah. That's no one, what about, so the bleachers and the wood look got put back in our last meeting. Those haven't, that I know of, unless it was while I stepped away to drop my kids, um, that hasn't factored into this. And I don't know where those stand in relation to this. So just bringing it up, I don't necessarily have opinions on it, but don't want to lose sight of it. They got added back into the project. They'll be part of the 90%. It did, but we did it. We I thought it was under the assumption that they'd be an adult. Uh, I'm sorry, a deduct. It alternate. is. Yeah. Yep. So just didn't want to lose sight of where those land. And I don't, again, I don't have an opinion on if it's before or after the fields. The fields is a huge ticket item. So I don't want to lose sight of that. And I, I agree that it is a priority. But so we wanted to bring that up. We still have the opportunity to vote on including the bleachers in and the wood look ceiling as a deduct alternate. 
Uh, yeah, just a quick comment. Uh, following up on Dawn, the, the, the I think treatment. where you left off the bleachers and the wood look ceiling to be one and two on your on your deduct alt list. So you you would have to you'd have to change that. Okay, so we have right. they were supposed to be one and two. They're supposed yeah. to be Charlie, let me, Charlie, let me call on you. Just just let me call on you. Ian, can you repeat what you just said? The November 17th meeting, there was a motion and a vote by this committee to put those two items, the wood look ceiling and the bleachers on the deduct alt list as one and two. I don't think you ordered them, but it was one one and two. So you would have to change that via vote. So we would just what we to, would to reorder them is. We'd already decided to keep them on the, the to have them be a deduct alternate. If we wanted to take them off that list, we would have to vote that now. Yes. You're saying okay. Either vote to take them off or vote to reorder them. Okay. And and put the fields as number one. All right. Let's maybe we could just start by going through the list and coming to a conclusion today of what we will put on the deduct alternate list. And if that means unvoting something, we will unvote them as part of this one to one by one process. Could I change my motion slightly? Uh, you can amend. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I would like to recommend that we include four alternates the eliminate the wood look ceilings the bleachers in the gym and the landscaping and the athletic fields as the four that we would consider in no particular order all right so i think you're withdrawing your motion and you're going to submit an, a, a separate motion let's does that make sense parliamentarians in the room yeah. yes okay so steve you can withdraw your I should propose uh, another motion. <clears throat> I will draw my motion. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah, okay. Uh, new motion to include four alternates in no particular order as shown on the screen, the woodlock ceilings, the bleachers, the landscaping and the fields that we would consider over the next month and come to a, an order later um, and not limited to that. Okay, do I hear a second? I'll second that. Second that. Okay. Any discussion? Just to be clear, this is about, sorry, I'll raise my hand up. Physically. <laughs> well, you're a co-chair, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not running the meeting, so I'm trying to still follow the rules. Um, so this is just over about a $2 million give or take order of magnitude of savings. Is that correct? If I'm doing easy math, so yes. 1.8 yeah. plus the under two. Yeah. So, okay. Just to give everyone a sense of what that, if holistically all four had to be taken, it would essentially, we, we believe based on estimates, save about $2 million. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so what we're saying here is, let's say right now, if the the estimate, the 90% estimate comes in at 112, we're still okay. But if it comes in at 112.5, we don't have a project. So I again, I think we should be inclusive of the possibilities, you know, that could potentially get us there until we know whether we've got something then we can decide to cut but right now to exclude possibilities means that we're tying our hands for that that eventuality now we don't know we the 90 percent estimate could come in at 107 who knows but i'm just saying from a risk management perspective what we're doing here is we're just increasing our risk I have Heather? Heather? Just a clarification on Matt's comment, actually. Um, does it, it, can we, if we add things to the deduct alt list today, 
Can we then in January when we're ordering them decide to take them off? So is sure. it? Yeah, we're just giving them direction. We need the okay. so today, to design something. So today maybe isn't necessarily the final deduct alt list, but it's the list of things that we're considering for deduct alts. Sounds yeah. like yeah. it. Yeah, we need to get pricing. We need to get pricing. So okay. we're asking so, the estimators, to give us the price on these items because we've always been using the 60% number. We want right. them to evaluate it with the 90% numbers. These numbers might go up, they might go down depending on the, how the rest of the estimate works. Okay. So we want pricing. We're not going to, you know, we're continuing the design with all these things in. I'm going to be really clear. We're continuing right. to advance the design with all these things in the project. And so, in January, when we come back to order the deduct alts, we could, it's if a we final add more decision. than these four, right, we could say then, well, thanks for the pricing, but we're only going to have these XYZ. four versus six. Or Correct. Something. Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I understand Matt's point. Thank you. Steve. Yeah, I, this is just to get us started, right? Yeah. So the four, I think that everyone, or a lot of us probably agreed, could be on that list are here. Not in not exclusive of any others that could be raised up in the future. Uh, that was my intent. So this is not a this would just be saying we want to include these four that Ian has nicely marked on the, the screen. And then someone can make another motion to add the other two if if it is so desired. That makes sense. Okay, Dora. I just want to clarify what Matt said, it, it, the way that it's worded, and I'm not trying to change what you said, Matt, but I want to be really clear. The bids will never come in at 112. <laughs> if the bids are going to come in at a hard number, uh, yeah. meaning a hard I, cost. I, yeah. so that, Sorry about yeah. that. Mistake. No, that's okay. Just uh, if anyone from the public that's watching or people that don't know the lingo, the one well, that you alluded to would be total project cost, which is hard cost plus soft cost. Right. Um, the hard cost we want to be under. It was it ninety on your chart, Ian? Anything over ninety, yeah, is troublesome. Eighty nine, seven eleven was where we felt. Yeah. So just to be really clear, those are the bids. When we get those, when is it? April, May, whatever the, because there's so many dates in my head. April. Um, this spring, April. These are the numbers that are highlighted on Ian's uh, chart here that we will be seeing. And what that will do is reduce that number by 2 million, not the total project cost. I mean, it, it, they're sort of related, but not really. So I just want to be really clear that that's what we're trying to do here is to save on the hard cost. So, so I, I know you didn't mean to, Matt. I just don't right. want to be No, I got I, I, I did. <laughs> Yeah, I know that makes you know sense. The difference. Yep, we're we're more familiar with the total project cost Correct. number. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Okay. Is that's there the, yeah. is there any more discussion on Steve's motion? So on the floor is a motion to include the wood look ceilings, removing the bleachers, reducing the landscaping, and removing the athletic fields. Did I hear a second on that? I thought Alexa right. seconded. Okay, so you seconded it, Don. Uh, I thought Alexa did. But Alexa, it, no. Alexa, Alexa seconded, sec seconded it. Okay, so um, if there's no further discussion, I'm going to call for a roll call vote. Alexa, aye. Court, aye. Uh, Heather, ah, sorry, I couldn't get to mute. Aye, yes. Frank. Frank. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Um, Peter. Yes. Don. Yes. Uh, Lori. She's been on and off. She may be off right now. Obviously, she's got a lot going on right now. Yeah. All right. Uh, Matt. Hi. Uh, Carrie's not with us. Pat, yes. Chris? Yes. Riley? Yes. Matt? Root? He may be off. Um, OK. 
Okay. And Steve Staszewski. Yes. Okay. So that motion passes. Do I hear any other motions on the DDOC alternate discussion? Um, there are no other motions. Yeah, I, I move that we uh, examine the deduct alternates of removing the outdoor classroom construction as we discussed this meeting to provide a stone dust path and to level the area to um, in the in the outdoor classroom space. And then secondly, to re, uh, rough in the speakers in the classroom uh, rather than providing. Uh, the full system Second. as deduct alternates. Yeah. Seconded by Clerk Booth. Any discussion? Yeah, I think none of these are attractive, but we're trying to uh, move the project uh, irrespective of uh, the budget because we simply don't know. Uh, uh, sorry, irrespective of the bids because we don't know what they, they're going to be. So, okay. Um, Lori, can you just speak to um, the the roughing in of the speakers in the outdoor classroom? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's I think it's very reasonable to get a price on the outdoor classroom based on what we talked about today. I apologize if there's a lot of background noise. Um, and so we're going to ask our estimators to do that. The classrooms. This is the classroom amplification system. This is the requirement of MSBA projects because it has pr proved to enhance student engagement within the classroom rather than the teacher yelling all the time. So what we would do here is we'd provide the rough in the conduits, the boxes, pull strings. We would not provide the infrastructure, hence the wire, the actual physical speaker and the microphone. They could be purchased later and added in, but the infrastructure would be in place to support them. So we'll get an updated price on that. We've done that previously as an easy option. We'll just get a new price. Okay. So that, that's something that's required for the classrooms. It's something I've heard Lori speak often about as the importance of it. It seems like that's just going to have to be paid for at some other time. Only if you need to take it. So again, this is a deduct alternate. Okay. All right. Okay. So just, just for understanding, Lorraine, you're telling us that the speakers are not about music per se, but about a teacher's ability to talk with students. Oh, absolutely. These are not classroom music speakers. This is what's called a amplification system. Right. And it, it's a teacher amplification. And frankly, it, it can be a student amplification too, because the device the teacher wears, if the student is presenting, the student hangs the microphone around their, their head and their voice can get amplified. So it is to make sure that there is a level distribution of, of volume throughout the classroom yeah. and that the teacher's not standing and shouting. I think it's a I think it's a red hat system we use now that are all portables that are exactly what you describe. They've become less portable. The portable pieces go missing. That's one of the things that's one of the reasons the MSBA moved to building them in is that they tend to walk. So this top cache is one of the manufacturers that we use if you want to look it up, but this is a built-in system um, that, that can be balanced better than a portable system. Right. I have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't see you. Um, go ahead. That's all right. It's gone. Um, I, a couple of things. I fully agree with what Lorraine's saying. I haven't not put these in a project in years. And we used to do um, up, we used to do 5% of the classrooms, no less than one. And that is really a way of, you need it per code. You need it um, because it is um, on some students' IEP that they may not hear um, as well as others and they need this amplification. And to suggest that it is you know, in one classroom, not another, uh, which is how we used to do it, the old way of designing, is that that was the, the classroom for the hard of hearing students. And that becomes troublesome in this day and age with wanting to have universal design and 
accessibility for all. So um, in the last probably half a dozen or more, which takes you back five, almost 10 years of projects, I've not done this in every single learning space. And that includes small group learning, frankly. So this is something that um, I think needs to be in the project from a universal design standpoint. And it's not just for hard of hearing students. It's for students who have distraction from background noise, rain pellets on the windowsill on a rainy, pouring rain day where they can't focus on the teacher, but rather on distraction noises. So it's not just for students that need the hearing assistance, but for amplification of the teacher. So I know what this is, I understand it, and I think it needs to be in all the learning spaces as designed. Alexa, thank you, Don. I'm wondering if, I, don't remember, I think it was Matt who made the motion would consider removing his motion and consider these two items separately. Sure. <laughs> Uh, okay. I mean, although again, I keep reminding people this is an alt deduct. This is not VE. <laughs> okay, so we would only do this if we absolutely had to, uh, in order to be able to build the project at all. So you know, I, I just would just want to keep reminding people. But even so, yeah. I withdraw my motion. I make a new motion uh, to uh, investigate or estimate the alt deduct option of removing the outdoor classroom construction and replacing with a stone dust path and a level area uh, that could be uh, later, hopefully developed into more formal outdoor classrooms. I'll second that. Thank you, any discussion? I will call to vote that. <clears throat> Yes. Court? Aye. Um, Heather? Aye. Yes. Frank? Can anyone see Frank or Frank? I can't see him. I was looking for him. Where'd he go? I can't find him. Okay. Um, Peter? Yes. Don? Yes, as long as it's still accessible. Larry? Yes. Matt? Aye. Harry's not with us. Pat? Chris Popov? Yes. Charlie Parker? Yes. Pat Root? He wrote it yes. Okay. Steven Sitchowski? Yes. Okay. So this passes. Um, do I now move to estimate? the well move to include as an alt option for alt deduct the roughing in of speakers in the classrooms rather than building in the full system um all right i, I i'm just going to make a comment and then steve i'll call on you um i'm opposed to considering this and matt i understand you know we really are only talking about worst case scenarios here but I don't think we can include in our worst case scenario an expectation that we could save $125,000 on something that is required in the classrooms and is specific to educating all kids and speaks to inclusivity. So I, I would not support that. I mean, wouldn't the alternative be something that would be paid for out of ff &E? It's it, it's not taking any money out of the project. That's still a soft cost. That's part of the 112 or 110 or <laughs> what 110. Let's call it that. Well, if if, if yeah, wait, I mean, wait, if, wait, if, the entire, Steve, if, if the entire Steve project, up. Um, if you want to respond, you can put your hand up. So let me go to Steve. He had his hand up, and then Lori, and then Chris, and then Court. If we got as far as accepting i would hope all of the other alternates and we have this as our only other way to move the school forward what would we do for amplification was there another solution that would get us by get us a school while we talk as a as a community about buying something you know in the future yes as we, we discussed know, a portable solution are 
what is the affordable solution? The, oh, portable, you know? portable <laughs> Sorry. solution that wouldn't be built in. And that would save dollars, I would assume. And it, it wouldn't be in the bid that. scope. You would also only buy a few portable and you would have to have them travel with the student that most needs it. You would yeah. not buy one for every classroom. And again, I would, imagine. I would hope that this was the last ditch effort to move the school forward. Would that meet our code and you know regulatory requirements uh, by including it in that? Since package? we're not an MSBA project, we have this alternative. If we were an MSBA project, we wouldn't. Lori? Thanks. Um, so this is a these are systems we've retrofitted into the older schools at the elementary. We have permanent systems in classrooms because it's that important. You cannot single out students who need these systems that we can only place them in certain settings and only send them to certain rooms or a system has to travel. Those days are very, very long gone. So to, to think that over 125,000 we're gonna risk the well-being of those kids, which MA, MSBA would not allow us to do for very good reason, seems really unacceptable. So I feel very strongly this cannot be on the list. I understand we're trying to be sure we get to budget if things aren't going the way they should, but this, this to me is an absolute, it needs to stay in. Thank you, Chris. Just a point of order, I don't know if I heard a second to Matt's motion, so I'll second it now for discussion and it, we've already entered into discussion, so this is really just to catch up to continue our discussion of this pending motion. Does that make I sense, everybody? Maybe, maybe I missed the second. I seconded it. Oh, thank you, Alexa, sorry. But anyway, thanks. Is there any further discussion? So the motion on the floor is to uh, rough in speakers and classrooms as the an all a deduct all that we would consider. Um, Alexa. Um, no. Court. No. Heather. No. Frank. I'm looking for him again. I still don't see him. He's off camera, so I can't tell what he's doing. Peter? No. Dawn? No. Lori? No. Matt Johnson? Aye. Harry, uh, Pat Nelson? No. Chris Popov? No. Charlie Parker? No. Matt Root? No. Steve Sosheski. No. All right, so that is not going to be included. So we've now got a list that we can give to our designers. Does this satisfy what uh, SMMA needs? Yes, thank you. Yep. Okay. Court? Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate what Mr. Johnson's trying to do here. Um, I don't see that he's uh, in favor of uh, removing rough in speakers. I think he's in favor of giving us a margin to save a project. Um, and in light of that, uh, uh, if, if $125,000 or give or take was the, the linchpin for an entire 110 million plus project, where would we go next? Is there any place for uh, creating the kind of margin that that he's advocating so so strongly for? And none of us want any of these cuts. That's not the purpose, as he has said uh, multiple times. But we are trying to save something much bigger than 125 here or 300 there. Where would yep. we go next? Uh, I, I would ask uh, our our project manager. Yep. So. I, I think just to frame this up again, our hope is to not have to take any of these items, right? This is the this is the last ditch effort to get back to a budget on bid day. Um, so the hope and, and is to not have to dip into this at all. Um, if you if you do need to dip into this and you 
need enough to cover this plus plus some uh you know in the tune of a hundred two hundred thousand dollars um we could find that money in the budget elsewhere you know the you have the ability to um do things like reduce your ff and e or it uh by that value you have the ability to um pull you know from your construction contingency which you don't really want to do it's not good practice to do that um, but you could do that if you wanted to reduce your construction contingency um you know there's there's a, a few areas in the in the total project budget that you could you could look to in that type of scenario just just to make sure that the project moves forward if you were to look at our current contingency and these uh, uh potential reductions on the list uh relative to the construction side of the budget the 90 million what's our what's our percentage margin do you have a, a rough number there about how much we could go over before we uh, start to uh, look at this list um yeah i think it goes back to this this chart here so on bid day if you get a bid of 89.7 million dollars or less uh you don't have to do anything you can utilize your bid contingency um and you've and you've budgeted accordingly um if you get a bid above 89.7 million then you would you would have to start utilizing and so that's that's uh four percent over the 60 percent estimate at that at that snapshot there and 11 percent over the construction budget which is you know twice twice what we're seeing currently with with bids that are coming in good. so thanks. you're so you're sitting pretty good and thanks for taking us through this slide again good yep yeah so in addition to that you've you've got now more than 1.8 uh, I didn't do the math, but it's two two something. Um, so that would get you up to ninety one, um, you know, ninety one point seven, ninety one point eight that you could accept a bid for at that point, and and still be okay and not have to touch other aspects of the budget, right? And so that's six percent over your CD estimate, and that's thirteen and a point three percent over your construction budget which is you know more more of what we've seen for recent uh cm at risk bids so through the chairs uh might we ask the uh, project manager to update this slide for us based on today's work absolutely yep. yeah we can do that yeah so requested charlie yeah not, not to upset the apple cart here uh but there was another suggestion that came in in the uh, in those letters from dean and it was the question on the bollards and I don't know that we can reopen that and and realize some savings and whether anybody wants to entertain that at this point but but uh you know there is you know some a considerable opportunity there given the fact that bollards were spread out to nine feet I think interval there's still a lot left and could we you know increase the the uh, I mean de decrease the bollards mm -hmm. and raise the curb I, I don't know whether that's feasible so, just Charlie. throwing it out Charlie, if I could ask, um, it's 9.30, it's a little after 9.30. Um, I think we could defer this conversation to our January meeting, at, because at that point we'll have some better estimates on savings. Um, and then we, at that point, Lorraine, it's, it could possibly be entertained again, the bollards. Or, or is that... Well, raising the curb changes a lot of work for us, so it's not actually a simple thing at all, um, because it is a grading and it affects drainage. So, I I read the email. Mike read the email. Uh, it's a it's a change in the approach and the feel of the site, but it does affect our drainage. So, um, it's not a simple thing. I just want to put that out there. Right. I, I just don't know that we can. Um, we have the bandwidth to continue to discuss this now if we 
but I guess what you're saying, Lorraine, is that we would need to give you direction today on that if we were going to. If you wanted us to get a price for it, yes. Okay, so, all right. So no one suggested that on the committee and that was the request and that's what we were going to our designers. Um, I am reluctant to introduce a, a whole other area of discussion at this point. It was not brought to the committee by committee members at the time when we could have gotten some, some feedback from our architects. Don, do you want to weigh in on this? I don't know. I mean, we've had a lot of discussion about bollards. I, you know, um, short of redesigning the whole area with a raised baller or raised curb and fewer bollards, I'm not sure what the solution would be, but I just want to, when I think about bollards and all the discussions we've had, I think about the Apple store in Hingham that was recently driven into, and I do have concerns about safety, even with flush curbs, it, you know, is definitely a safety concern. <coughs> so um, could 978 please mute. Um, thank you. And I don't know. So I don't really, I, I don't feel strongly one way or another, except that the safety of our students is obviously my number one priority. So I'm reluctant to reduce anything without some sort of, um, you know, solution that's thought out and designed with safety in mind, other than what it is, which I think is what Mike did with the number of dollars and the flush curves. So I didn't really answer your question, Pat. I'm just like telling you what's on my mind when I think about ballers. Well, if I, <laughs> let me put it this way. Is there anybody else who wants to talk ballers now and stay on this call and feels that there is room to consider bollards, given what our our experts have already told us about the bollards, we've we've looked at the bollards before. I think we've made some reductions. Does anyone else feel that we need to revisit that? And I think I'll just ask you to raise your hand and speak out if you do. I we've heard from our experts on this. I'm just not sure that we we can reopen it now. All right, seeing no one, um, I'm going to close this discussion. And um, thank you, everybody, for going through this list and going through this exercise. Um, I, our next uh, agenda item, and now I'm looking, is public comment. Do we have any public comment? All right. Uh, Mr. Banfield. Hi, Dean Banfield, 73 Walden Terrace. I wanna thank the committee for the robust conversation that it engaged in around the irrigation of the playing fields. Um, I do feel uh, pretty strongly that the recommendation that I made is very, is very reasonable. And this whole idea of optimizing playability uh, the soils you have up there are very well drained. You're putting a septic system in that same basic area. So drainage, a subsoil drainage is very good up there. I'm not that concerned that the six inches of crushed stone is important. The entire uh, playing field project that was done at the high school, millions of dollars spent, no geotextile fabric under the basic field areas, just under the, under the surfaces of the uh, infield areas to prevent uh, incursion of weeds, et cetera, uh, and to keep the separation of layers uh, as important in those, in those uh, I guess they're the clay soils that are used in infield areas. So I do appreciate it. And I would really like to see us try to find a way to get irrigation just basically in the basic bid. So that's good. I think that the conversation was fantastic. Um, I do think if you're looking for uh, money, in the seat cushions at the end of this project, you absolutely are gonna to wanna to look 
to find a way to sod these fields. Right now we have a, a project that's going to have grass seed put on there in two years before you're able to even use the fields. So that's a long time for the town to wait to use the fields. So if you're looking for money, you have to, you know, have to upgrade, you know, a dollar a square foot or something to get sod put in so you can actually use the fields as soon as the school has been built. So that's an important thing to also consider. It's also not in the bid. Um, so I've looked at these fields very in very high detail and sod would be an important thing to go looking for money for. Um, regarding the bollards, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that you're not gonna consider them. I think they're dead ugly. I also think they're not critical if you have a regular raised curb. The children at Alcott, at Thoreau, at Willard, deal with raised curbs. They do not trip. They do not, they've learned how to use them. And by the time they get to middle school, they can step off a bus over a raised curb and onto a sidewalk. Um, and so the, the, these rows of bollards are, we're not worried about driving a bus into the building. They'll drive onto the playing field if they drive through those sidewalks. So I don't, I'm not that concerned about that. Vaughn's concerned, probably not the big Apple store debacle that we were concerned about. Um, so I'd like to see those bollards just removed from those two rows of drop off. Um, uh, if this committee wants them there, I'd like to see the, the architects draw renderings that show those bollards to the town. They've been showing uh, bus drop off areas that are diagonal, diagonal park buses forever. And that's not how that parking lot is designed. And we've been seeing pictures of, you know, children laughing and smiling on the sidewalks. No bollards have been there and the buses are parked in, in a diagonal pattern, which is not the design. So update your renderings so that the town can see what they're voting for. That's all. So thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate my, my, my stuff being considered. So I, I, and if the committee doesn't take it, it's fine, but, but thanks a lot. It's been great. Thank you, Dean, for your efforts. Uh, are there any other citizens' comments, public comments? Okay, seeing none, um, next steps. When is our next meeting, Ian? And the next steps you wanna? January 26th is the next scheduled meeting. Thursday, January 26th. We will have the, um, we need to schedule something before then, I think, right? We're, we're gonna get the 90% the, um, on January 13th, is that? Special town yeah. meeting is the 19th, just so we're going Town meeting is the 19th. So I, I'm wondering if we wanna schedule for the Thursday after the 13th. That's town, town meeting day, but yeah. Well, that is town meeting day. <laughs> okay. Um, that's when we would have, so we could schedule something. Um, let's schedule for the town meeting day. I think that this committee would need to, to hear or participate in some discussion once we get these next bids, these next estimates. Uh, I think uh, we should go ahead. And schedule. I have a clarity question. The reconciled bids are available on the 13th or that's when the design team receives them? Because typically there's a process of reconciliation that takes a few days. Those are the reconciled numbers to the committee. So we, we will have, um, the professionals will have the numbers on the 10th. Let me, let me okay. make sure. So that earlier time. that week, you get that, you receive them, you reconcile them, which is typically an all day meeting with consultants and design, you know, design team and professionals in the room. And then, okay. So you probably, the 11th, you probably do that. The 12th, they crunch, re-crunch their numbers and then you send them out the 13th. Am I just, I'm trying to wrap yep. my head around how yep. this is, okay. Yeah. So, okay. Um, so they'll be shared out via email to the committee? Like how is that process happening? Or do we want to try to have a meeting on the 13th to share them? I, I guess that's why I'm asking. How, how is this information going to be shared to the committee? What's the best process? Uh, we will send out the estimates and the um, 
the reconciled estimates and the comparison sheets the same way that we have on the previous estimates so we can email those out yeah now that i'm not looking at a december calendar can i propose that we we do schedule a meeting for the, the morning of the 13th i think that's very wise yeah so it, it, with the caveat that our committee may not see the numbers ahead of the meeting, I guess is what I'm trying to understand if we were to try to do that, which I'm fine with. Um, January 13th is a Friday, just so everyone knows. Um, yeah, it is. But I don't know that in design team, correct me if I'm wrong, if that would be available ahead of the meeting or maybe the night before, I don't know, but I just don't want people to think they're gonna have time to like sit with the estimate and go through it as opposed to just being presented it because there may not be time for that. So design yeah. team, if you can weigh in on your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, we're reconciling all day on the Tuesday. As you know, it's a full day event, it usually finishes at five or 6 p.m. Then the estimators have some cleanup to do. I would say we would be lucky to get it back on the 13th or on the 12th. But if we get it, we'll issue it, obviously. Okay, does the committee want to convene on the 13th to whether we have it ahead of time or presented it live? I, I think that's good timing because we have, you know, at that point, less than a week before special town meeting, but to have a better understanding of where the costs are, where our deduct alternate costs are, and what our possible plan to, you know, order those and everything, kind of have that at the ready because some of that may come up at special town meeting. I have no idea. I also think it would be a good idea for us to get together, even if we haven't seen them prior, at least, in, and that would be the only agenda item. Uh, yeah. We could try to make it a short meeting. It is a Friday morning. I'm fine with that, Pat. Others can weigh in, but I, I think we should see them and meet for sure before special town meeting. Yeah. And the, one of the other milestones we were tracking, the motions are posted for special town meeting on this Tuesday's 17th. So you'd be meeting before that, which is good. Okay. And design team, are you available on the 13th? <laughs> Given that it's yeah. a Friday and we usually yes. meet on Thursdays. Yeah, yep. we can be there. Yep. Okay, then I uh, think that's gonna be our next meeting. Okay. All right. Um, uh, and I think if there's nothing else, if there's no new business, we can adjourn. Do I hear a mo motion to adjourn? I don't think you need a motion, Pat. I, I don't. Okay. Quorum. Yep. I'm going to then say we're adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Happy holidays, Thank you. everyone. Hey, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pat.